West of the Rockies, you're on the air on uh, Ghost to Ghost AM. Hi. Hello, Art. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And to you. Where are you, uh, sir? This is Peter from Lakewood, Colorado. I talked to you two years ago, and strangely enough, it was about this time. Okay. Um, many, many years. This is a true story. It did happen to me. Okay. And um, many, many years ago, I was in the ministry and uh, studying the ministry, and I had taken my grandfather out to uh, for an evening of uh, sporting events, and uh, he lived in the country. Um, and I took him back home around 11:30, 12 o'clock, when the sporting event had finished. Mm -hmm. And um, after leaving him at his home, which was a farmhouse, I was coming down the country road. And there was like a bend in the road, and uh, looking out my car window, I saw something was stirring the horses out in the field. And uh, being, uh, you know, those are our horses, I decided to park my car just uh, past the bend and walk my way back to the bend. And I started looking over the barbed wire fence to see what was stirring the horses. Sure. As I started looking uh, out toward the horses, I heard a rumbling in the weeds and the grass only a few feet in front of me. When you say rumbling, what do you mean? Kind of a moving of the grass or kind of the crackling of uh, of weeds. You so know? More, like a, more like a rustling. There you go. Okay. And as I looked, this is where everything starts getting strange. Um, as I looked into the weeds and the grass there, I saw a sort of a vision of a man and a woman laying in the grass. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought to myself, I said, uh, I said, oh, this is stupid. You've walked on to something private here in the middle of the night. And, and I just couldn't cogitate what was going on. As I looked again, these two figures kind of shrunk. I don't know how to others say it, but they just kind of shrunk. You mean literally? Literally, this vision kind of shrunk in, in size and became something black and white and furry and just ran right toward me and as it came right to me oh at, in the bend yes. there was there was a, a water pipe you know that runs uh, for the ditches that run under the dirt roads yes it went right into the ditch into this um this drain this uh, drain pipe that went on that goes under the um uh, the, the road there anyway to make as, as to go on I was very confused and I kept on looking at the end of this pipe that went under the road and as I looked further two little hands emerged out and grabbed the edge of the pipe and I kept on looking and out of the oh, pipe man. came the face of a little boy and it was a grayish white ghoulish looking little face and it had black fur all over where his hair was. And he looked at me, I looked at him, and startled, it went, rustled back into the pipe. Well, I was afraid. I walked. Afraid? My, my God, I'd be running on that as fast as my feet would carry me long before it came back out of the pipe. I mean, when the thing shriveled and went into the pipe, I'd be gone. How did you stand your ground? Well, Art, I was confused. I was When you see something starting like that, I wasn't scared. It was more like, first of all, it was, oops, I, I uh, walked into something. All of a sudden, it shrunk, and I got confused. I didn't know what to make. When I saw that little face come out and then go back in, I headed back for my car. I got in my car, started it up, and then I said to myself, hey, wait a minute, you are a divinity student, you're a minister, there's nothing that can, you know, harm you. So I stopped, turned off the car, went back out there to the bend, got down on my knees and started praying. And after I said a few prayers, I, I just got back up, got in my car and took off. The next day, I went to my grandfather and I t told him about what happened and he said, I don't want to tell you what went on here. I want you to tell your father the same thing and see what he has to say. Mm -hmm. I said it to him and I went back and told my father and my father said that many years ago he and uh, my grandfather were at the farmhouse and there used to be a little house, a small little one bedroom house right where that bend was and a woman had lost her child and they had heard that she had turned to black magic to try to have some kind of connection with her dead child. Yes. And, the, and one time, well, uh, during what well, they felt she was performing, they saw a fireball come out of her house, the front of her house, roll across the yard, roll across the uh, 
the, the gravel area in the bend, I mean the road there in the bend, jump over the fence and roll around in the field right about where the horses were. And um, I know it sounds like a fantastic story, but it is a true story, and I think it was the, what I saw in that pipe was the ghost of that little boy. And you know, the only question that I just I have to have answered sure. is whether what you saw really was what was left of that little boy, not gone elsewhere but trapped here, or whether it was just some sort of weak image, some sort of barely visible, horribly repeating little loop of, you know, what had occurred. Until I find out the answer to that question, these kinds of stories will forever scare me. Because if it was the uh, the soul of that little boy, then obviously he wasn't where he should have been. All right, um, you know, I have, uh, I'm, uh, you know, in my 40s and, uh, I've tried to figure that one out, uh, but I can tell you, the face of that little boy, that grayish, uh, the only other time I've seen something like that was I was volunteering in the hospital and I saw a little child who was about to pass away. He had that same grayish pallor, and uh, if it wasn't something supernatural that the, um, uh, you know, these black magic had produced, it definitely was that little child who's caught in that corner and maybe will be there forever. But um, I, I, I told you this story two years ago and you had kind of the same response and uh, it's, it's, it's the one that will puzzle me for the rest, uh, till my grave, that's for sure. I appreciate your telling it, or in this case, retelling it. Thank you, my friend. Art, we love you here in Denver. Thank you. Take care. Um, that will haunt me uh, forever with regard to this subject. Uh, truly, it seems impossible to believe, though I suppose it is possible, that an innocent youngster dying way before his time would have his spirit trapped through some horrible cosmic joke here on Earth. I don't want to believe that. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi there, good evening, audience. Good evening, you're going to have to get good and close to the phone and speak up good and loud. Where are you calling from? Calling you from Texas. All right. I have a very good story for you. Fire away. Okay, this happened when I was 19 years old, and I was looking for my first apartment. And I had an apartment locator help me out. Sure. Of course, trying to find something that I could afford on a student's salary. You bet. Now, I do believe, because of what happened to me at this age, that spirits try to trick us. They try to make us think that they masquerade, that they are good people, mm -hmm. that they are indeed only masquerading as good departed, and their intentions are different. Sure. What we believe. Yeah, I, I can't rule anything out. I mean, there are obvious good deeds. You heard the lady on the freeway in Boston. Yes, well, that was indeed a good deed. Well, but sometimes I think that they masquerade as good when they really are evil. So do I. Some of them are evil. Yes. Anyway, this apartment that I inherited, they called me on the phone. They told me they had this great apartment for me, that it was furnished, and everything was in it, equipped kitchen, everything, towels, you name it. It had it, bed sheets. It was a, belonged to an old woman who had died, and they didn't, she had nobody left, so they didn't have anybody to give these things to, and they were trying to rent it to someone like me. I, of course, jumped at it because it was quite economical. Okay. And uh, as soon as I moved in, funny things started happening. Like what? Well, the first week when I was cleaning house, and, of course, it had cleaning supplies there. I didn't have to buy a darn thing. And I was cleaning my house. Oh, and I have to tell you, the windows had locks and bolts on them. The door had deadbolt. It had two deadbolts. It had chain, the chain that goes over. Right. Plus, it had, you know, an extra, the regular lock. And then the little, you know, those little tabs that go up and down into the floor and the ceiling? I do. Okay. The windows also had those. All right. So this was somebody who had been uh, very security conscious. Yes. She was quite elderly. So anyway, I am cleaning, and all of a sudden the phone rang. You know, I had the mop and the soap and everything out. And I go to answer the phone, I come back, well, all my cleaning supplies are gone. Gone? So I thought that was weird. Another time I was cooking, 
And same thing, either a knock would happen at the door or the phone would ring any time I tried to use something that belonged to this woman. And this time I was cooking. I had the food on the stove. I had everything, you know, the cutting board out, the knives, everything. The phone rang. I went to see what was happening, picked up the phone, nobody there. I come back, and the whole kitchen's clean. Oh, boy. The whole kitchen is clean? It's clean. There are no dishes dirty in the sink you know, that I had used that had belonged to her. It was as if, you know, the spirit was saying, hey, this is mine. You can't use it. All right. Now, you know, at this point, I would freak out. At this point, you know, I'm getting, yeah, as you say, okay? Well, one night... There are two other eerie things that happen here, and each time they just start getting eerier and eerier. One night I'm asleep, and as I say, I live by myself. I'm 19 years old. I'm not going to tell you about my cat. Okay, my cat just started going totally berserk. Uh -huh. And I'm asleep, and I wake up in the middle of the night, and I feel somebody staring at me. And I said, nah, you know, it's just me. And I go back to sleep. And in the morning, I wake up. And the windows are all open, including the one in the kitchen, the one in the living room, the one in the bedroom. Mm. They're all open. And mm. mind you, they had all the bolts and everything on them. The door is standing wide open. Okay, at this point, I've got to ask, how could you stay there? Well, I just started thinking, okay, well, I'm going to beat her at, this, at her game. Okay, I would call my mom and say, Mom, you know, this is happening. She says, nah, you just, you just. You know, you can beat this. And I'm going, okay, well, I'm going to play this game. All right? Uh -huh. So I started saying, okay, if you're good, you can stay. If you're bad, you must go. And anything, something eerie, anytime something eerie would happen, like my cat would started attacking people when they came in, uh -huh. and my cat was very docile. And I just started saying, okay, spirit, if you're good, you may stay. If you're bad, you must go. Mm. And the spirit would disappear. Now, but, another but, but time. Then, but then come back. But then come back for more, yes. Well, you know, as a 19-year-old, you think, okay, well, you know, this is just a game. Anyway, the very last straw, a friend and I took another friend to the airport. We were at my apartment. Uh, we left. I locked everything up. We went to the airport. We came back. Okay, just my other friend and I. Yes. We try to open the door, and again, I had my keys in hand, and I opened the first lock, and I opened the second lock, and I opened the third lock. Sure. And I'm trying to open the door, and the door is unlocked. You can tell it's unlocked, you know, because you try to push on it, and it would open just kind of like an inch, but sure. not open any further than that. Yes. And my girlfriend, my, ha my hair is standing up on my arm as I'm doing it. <laughs> You're trying to tell me somebody's on the other end holding the door closed. Exactly. Oh. And we're pushing on the door. And finally, she's with me. I say, help me. Something's happened. You know, she won't let me in. And uh, we're pushing on the door going, let us in. Let us in. And all of a sudden, I said, oh, wait, I'm supposed to say this. If you're good, you may stay. If you're bad, you must go. All of a sudden, the door flies open, and we're in the apartment. I'd be out of that apartment so fast, cheap and goodbye or not, I'd be gone. We were gone. <laughs> that, that was enough, huh? I packed up my cat, and I said, <laughs> we're gone. <laughs> you know, uh, while we're on the subject, cats absolutely sense the presence of things that we do not. That is true. There's no question about it. A lot of people will have things to... Listen, thank you very much for your call, and, and listen on the air. I, I can tell you as a cat person, that's absolutely true. Cats, cats, haven't you ever noticed? They always see things that we don't see. Now, you might imagine they're just sort of concocting a little playful mouse or something in their mind, and maybe, you know, maybe they do a little of that, but they also unaccountably and totally freak out. And I have been convinced for years that they see things that we don't. And we don't know a lot about the difference between humans and animals and, the, you know, what we see and what they see. And it may well be that they see in a spectrum or a dimension that we don't. Cats are uniquely sensitive to the presence of, I think, things that we don't know about. Wild Card Line, you're on the air with Ghost to Ghost AM. Hello. Hi, good evening, Art. Good evening. I'm Bob from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Hi, Bob. 
about three years ago, I worked as a motel desk clerk. There was a gentleman in room three who would come over every morning at about four o'clock and drive me crazy with uh, really inane conversation about, you know, how about them Yankees and stuff like that. Yeah, I know those people. <laughs> and um, it used to be a, 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 a test of my patience to uh, be courteous to this gentleman. And he would always end his conversation with a long tribute to his mother and what a saint she had been, and he would go on and on and on. She had passed away about 10 years ago. Sure. Well, he did this for maybe, you know, just about every night. But one night he said, you know, I think the ghost, I think the spirit of my mother may be visiting me because the other night there was a, a knock on the bedboard. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. Well, you know, he probably bumped it with his elbow. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> So I didn't think much of it. And uh, shortly thereafter, he was invited by his brother in Connecticut to go visit. So I thought, well, finally we're going to get some peace and quiet here. So the, the time came, and he took off to Connecticut, and his room was uh, empty. And I, I was looking forward to a night of peace. <laughs> and um, it was pretty quiet until about 1 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, the phone rang at the desk, and it indicated that there was a call coming from room number four, which, of course, was the room next to his. Yes. And I thought, you know, this is odd. I don't remember anyone being in room four. And I looked at the registration sheet, and there was nobody registered for room four. I wouldn't like that. But I thought, well, you know, maybe maybe the maid left the door open or something, and one of the guests sure. walked into that room or something. Logical. So I answered the phone. And this voice from a thousand miles away of an old woman says, Oh, I guess I have the wrong party, and faded out to nothing. So I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe I better go look, because as it happened, room four was directly across from where the motel office was. Yes. So I walked over about 30 feet. Uh -huh. I opened the door. Absolutely no one in the room. The phone was on the hook. And it occurred to me that maybe what happened was this gentleman's mother had come to visit him in room number three in spirit, found that he wasn't there, became confused and decided to look into room number four, and somehow managed to manipulate the phone to work. And... Um, <laughs> I have no other explanation. <laughs> I appreciate the story. Thank you. Um, interesting because, of course, a motel phone system is utterly private. In other words, that call could not have come from anywhere else but room four. So I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> there are many accounts of spirits making phone calls. A wild card line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Where, where are you? I'm calling from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, BC, all right. Um, uh, my brother and I both saw it. I was about four or five. My brother's three and a half old, years older than me. We uh, came to town, Vancouver here. We weren't living here. And uh, to visit our, uh, I guess, godparents. And uh, we'd been watching TV uh, upstairs in the house. Uh, our parents and their parents, uh, like they have kids, we're uh, playing Knafka in, in the kitchen, and at that time, 10 o'clock came around. Uh, all the good shows were over, and all the news came on, so mm -hmm. kids weren't interested in that. We decided to go see what our cousin was doing. We called him Cousins downstairs. He had a, a bedroom in the basement. It was an unfinished basement, basically just a, a rectangle of the house with just two walls built into the corner to make his room. The rest of it was bare open uh, basement. So we'd go through the kitchen where his parents were playing, and uh, had to go down these steps to go down to the basement, and uh, we go past them and down the steps. We get halfway down. We look across to where his room is, and there's a ghost, the white shadowy type that you can see through, you know, transparent and all oh, that, yes. just like Ghostbusters. And he's uh, he's spying on our cousin. We could see through him. He's a young guy. I'd say now, cause I'm thinking about it, in his late. Late twenties. Do you in, think he knew? Future. Do you think he knew that you could see him? No, this is this is how why it gets good. Exactly. There's, there's more to this. So, 
So we see a ghost. We can see he's wearing a suit. He's got, you know, a loose style, like old style suit, you know, like the sure. 40s or whatever. Sure. Um, and he's peering around a, a door frame, the door frame of going to entering into the room as if, you know, he didn't want to be seen, right? Yeah. Peeking around like a human would. Sure. You can see the door frame through him. You know, it's just like Ghostbusters. You see details, but it's all white. You yes. Know? But you can see shades of white, right? To differentiate different things. And we can also see part of a dartboard that his left shoulder was covering uh, through him, too. And instantly, I, I was the first one down the steps. I turned to go up the steps. My brother's looking at me now, and we both yelled, Ghost, at the same time, right? <laughs> And this thing swung around. We surprised it. Oh, and we look oh, back oh, at the oh, ghost. Oh, he swings oh. around now, and he's looking right at us with his big, wide eyes like we scared it, right? Yeah, that's a twist on it. Yeah. And then, so anyways, then he just turns to what, the very end of the house. He was at one end, and at the other end was a, a swinging door that went out to a mushroom room that my godparents grew mushrooms, and then out to the backyard into the back alley. Another door went out that way. He just ran for that door, and he just crossed this house in Half a second. He went so fast you could see a blur of legs and arms as he was running. He left a white streak as tall as he was right from where he started to where he went out the store. And the door, didn't, he didn't go through it. It swung open real quick and shut. You know, like, whee, ta And that was it. He was gone. <laughs> and we were just about to turn to go back up the steps, and our parents were already at the top of the steps looking down. And I was like, what's going on? And we told them the story, and we went out to the backyard, checked out. I guess they assumed it was a burglar that we saw, right? Sure. And there was nothing. So... That was it. That scared the... <laughs> it didn't scare us. We were pretty calm about it. It was like, wow, neat, after, you know, five minutes after it happened, right? Well, it is the first instance I've ever heard of human scaring ghost, and I like it. It is possible. Who knows what makes a ghost visible? And it is kind of nice to think that occasionally, uh, without their knowledge, they become visible, doing their usually invisible snooping, and we catch them if you uh, if you can see my studio cam I've, I've got this really cool on the island of Rhodes when we were there Ramona found this really neat I don't know what it is it's like a tube with a hand on it I guess it's basically a back scratcher although the hand looks a little eerie and when you turn the tube over it makes a weird sound hear that And I was having more fun with this thing on the cruise because it makes such an obscene little sound. And I will hold this up so that uh, so that you can see it on the studio cam. Ah, <laughs> uh, strange. Wild card line, you're on the air. Good morning. Hi there, how you doing? Okay, where are you, sir? I'm in lovely Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, California, KSCO. Right close to the ocean. I'm glad you're on KSCO now. So are we, yes. Uh, you have a ghost story for us. Yeah, I do. Actually, I've had a couple of strange experiences, but I'll just uh, list the one that sticks in my mind the most. Um, my, I grew up with... Uh, my mother was a medium and my father was a musician. Strange life. We were on the road a lot. and um, You bet. Never stayed in any place longer than a couple of, you know, two or three months at a time. I know the life, yes. <laughs> well, and... Uh, we just moved into a place in Minneapolis, and um, it was a new apartment, and uh, we were all sort of camped out on the floor. It was a big sort of studio apartment with the kitchen offset and a bathroom and a large sort of bedroom, living quarters, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, there was my mother and I and my father all sleeping on the floor, laid out on, on blankets and things. And I just started to nod off, and um, she woke me up, and she said, Honey... Look in the kitchen. Hmm. And I woke up, and I, I didn't sit up or anything. I just sort of opened my eyes and sort of peered through the blankets. And there was a party of probably somewhere between 15 and 20 people um, in cocktail outfits. Um, I, I don't remember enough to remember the period or whatever, but they were they were well-dressed. I remember women had jewelry on. Men were wearing... Um, wait, 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 wait. This is in your private place? This is in our kitchen. In your kitchen? You walked in and there's 15 to 20 people? I didn't walk in. I was I was laying on the floor. Yeah? And my and my mother waking up. I was, I was lying next to her and she woke me up and she said, Yes? Look what's happening. So I sat and watched for a while and I watched um, a man who I will never forget uh, how he looked. He was wearing a um, dark suit. He had brown, very neat hair and he was talking to a a woman, 
and he had a drink in his hand. She had a drink in her hand. And I watched him for a while, and um, he saw me, and he saw my mother, and we were awake. My dad was laying next to my mother asleep, and I was yes. laying next to her, and, and she said, be, be real quiet, don't do anything. She whispered, you know, and I said, okay. And um, he made a motion to the woman, and he came, came right over to me, leaned right over me, and my blankets were down sort of six inches from my chin or whatever, and he grabbed the blankets, tucked them around my my uh, shoulders and uh, my eyelids were like half open and getting weird chills now I'm talking about this but and uh, tucked him in and uh, walked right back to the rest of the party it happened for a few less than several couple of minutes maybe and they sort of just stopped and I remember asking my mom what happened and she said well I think that we just saw a cocktail party that happened here a while back well when you say they just stopped. I mean, we're talking about 15 or 20 people. You mean they just vaporized? That's right. Yeah, and it sounds really, really terrible and really cheesy, and, and I really hate to, to be a part of the whole cheesiness when it comes to this kind of paranormal stuff. But but it really happened. It, it really happened, and, and also they were um, they were semi-transparent. In other words, you could see you could see things through them, but they did they did seem to have a sort of three-dimensional quality. And, and they were dressed in what manner? Do you recall? I mean, I, was it a period? Could you identify a period of dress? I don't. I don't know now. I mean, now the way I remember it, yes, there it was a period of you know 30s or 40s. But that could definitely be coloring in my part as far as uh, you know the things that I've seen and learned. Was there any attendant flash or other phenomena that accompanied their coming and going? None. What's well. As far as their coming goes, I was woken up by my mom and she. So you wouldn't know. So I wouldn't know. As far as they're going, no, they just sort of left and they just sort of drifted off. <laughs> That's a weird story. I, you, you've got to wonder if occasionally there's not a kind of a slip in the space-time continuum. I very much believe that. I very much think that's what happened. And I, more than being spirits sort of that are walking around this world, I wonder if I didn't just sort of see back in time or who knows. And the, the odd thing is my mom's dead now. She died of cancer. Um, but before she died, in my adult life, I brought this up several times. And, I mean, shortly before she died, I brought it up to her. And, uh, I mean, everything is exactly what I described it as far as her memory and my memory goes. So it, it, um, there may be coloring there, certainly from, um, you know, my, my youth. But uh, but your mom recalls it as you did. Absolutely. Oh, that's a weird one, sir. That's a weird one. I really appreciate your call. Yeah, well, thank you for taking that little right. show. Thank you. Uh, there you are. I've heard of these things before. I don't know what it is that we're talking about here. Uh, but as I said, I think a kind of a slip uh, occasionally occurs. Maybe a dimensional slip. Maybe a space-time continuum little little crack in the wall, in the dimensional wall. I don't know. But something comes across, and it's there, uh, or it's almost there. And then, as quickly as it came, it's gone. Why is it so interesting? Because of what it tells us about what we may be living in. And that may be our own dimension, that it is occasionally broached or touched by another. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. My Hi. name is Sherry, and I'm from Kansas City. Hi, Sherry. Okay, this happened back in 1980. I was dating this really neat city councilman, and he had bought an older home, beautiful old home, and um, he converted this big attic into a beautiful big bedroom. Mm -hmm. And it must have been, I don't know, 30 feet long on this one side, and that whole side was nothing but a big closet, huge long closet. You know how you are about closets? Oh, yes. So am I. Now, up until then, I never believed in this stuff. So he was asleep one night, and I hadn't been, but I fell asleep, and a knocking woke me up. Mm. Didn't stir him at all. So I kind of opened my eyes and was looking, you know, and I looked over at the closet, and out popped this head. A head? Down to the shoulders. Oh, Lord. I head out of the closet to the shoulders? Down to her shoulders. She popped her head out, 
and she had short brown kind of wavy hair and a flowery dress on. Yeah. And I stared, you know, and I was kind of froze, and I just stared and looked, and then she turned her head and looked at me, and she we kind of eye to eye, you know, and she went back in the closet, and I just. <sighs> I mean, I woke him up. I said, Ed, wake up, wake up. I just saw the most strange thing. I know I saw it. And he said, what was it? What'd she look like? He, I told him, he says, oh, don't worry about her. He said, uh, she's real nice. He said, when I built this room, she, I saw her when I finished the closet. He said, uh, she walked in there. But what we figured out was it. He said why she was there. Was this house was built by her father when she got married, and the man left her, and she committed suicide in the attic. Great. And so she was in your closet. Yes, and she lived in the closet, and she liked him because he said, don't worry about it, she's really nice. Uh-huh. Well, I told her, she can have him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that was the end of that, huh? No, I got out of that deal. I don't blame you at all. Thank you very much for the call. I don't like open closets at night. Now, I've never had anything peek out of my closet, and if I did, my my intense dislike of open closets at night would quickly convert to, I'm leaving this closet for somebody else. I'd be out of here. There is no way, there's no way on God's green earth that I would go to sleep. Uh, with a closet open or closed, from which somebody had peeked their head and shoulders out. No way. No way. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Um, I lived in California. Well, I live in California now. My name is George. And when I first moved into this apartment, it was a duplex. Um, I had a young couple move in next door to me. At that time, I was 21. And... I was kind of scared because the place, I didn't know the area or anything like that. And I went next door to meet some new neighbors, and while I was sitting on a couch, I, I heard things falling at my house, and I couldn't understand what was going on. And you were sure it was back at your house? Yeah, because the duplex, our kitchens were oh, on the wall. I understand, yes. And so I got up and went back to my house to see what was going on, and things were just coming out of the kitchen cupboards. <laughs> Coming so, out of the cupboard? Yes, it was literally coming out of the cupboard. You could physically see them coming out of the cupboard? Yes. And she came over to see what was going on. Uh-huh. And it stopped at my place. It literally stopped. And when I stood there and started picking the things up and putting them back on the shelves, she came over and was helping me, and it started at her house. Wow. And it was getting to us, so for quite a while, we spent our days during the daytime together <laughs> because it had really gotten scary. And one night when I was sleeping, I got shook wide awake and was told, get up now and come over here. And I I couldn't understand what was going on. I knew I was the only one in the house. <laughs> and I thought, this, this is crazy. And I turned the light on and I looked at the wall and there was a man standing there. And I thought, who are you? And he said, come here. And I walked over to him. And all of a sudden, he just disappeared. Well, it was kind of weird for me because I felt literally scared, scared to death. Yes. And yet, I knew he wanted me to do something. And it sounds strange, but it's actually documented in the newspaper. Um... I kept seeing myself in the mirror, and then all of a sudden, I could see his face. And I thought, this is this is not right. And I found it on my neighbor's wall. She came over, and her husband came over, and I moved the mirror. I literally moved the mirror, and there was a room behind the wall. Oh, my. And there was all these um, guns and knives, bow and arrows, Confederate money. Really? Flags hanging all over the walls. And it was kind of, I was just kind of freaking out at that point. I'm going, what is this? This is this is not right. And there was, I mean, there was gun cleaning kits. I just could not believe all the stuff. Yeah. And the next thing I know, I called the police. 
of all the odd things to do. I called the police, and the police come to the house, and they said to me, do you know who lived here? And I said, no. They said, the old chief of police died here. I said, you got to be kidding me. They said, no, all this stuff belonged to him. And I told them what he looked like. And they said, you don't, you don't happen to, are you joking with us? And I said, no, this is what I saw. And after that happened, after they took the guns and knives out of the house, everything stopped. It completely stopped. The stuff got, stopped coming out of the cupboards. But I moved. <laughs> I couldn't handle that no more. I had to get out of there. That would be me, too. Goodbye. That's it. Uh, I'm surprised you hung in as long as you did. Uh, but at least you, in a way, got an answer to what it was. Oh, yes. I really appreciate your call, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. This is Mike. I'm calling from L.A. I used to live up in uh, the Truckee area that's near Donner Pass. I was home alone. This went on over a span of about two and a half weeks, and it was during the day because I, was, I was, had taken time off work. And I, I wasn't when I was sleeping, and it wasn't during the dark. It was in the middle of the afternoon. Yes. And I'd be taking naps. It would be I waking up from a nap, and there was that paralysis that I've heard you guys talk about before. Yes. And the paralysis, and somebody would sit on my bed. Well, it's just me. Doors locked, windows locked, dogs outside. And this went on, and I could, if I just moved a muscle, it, the it thing would go away. And then that was not a problem. But it culminated after about two and a half weeks, one afternoon. This is absolutely the truth, is something sits on my bed. And I was more conscious, more aware of it than ever before. And I remember the time of day, I remember the sun was out, no problem. And I had just been taking a nap, and I'm wide awake. There is a woman reclining on the side of my bed on the corner. And I go, oh, I, I am in trouble now. Because I've never seen a ghost before. I'd never, And this was for real, for real, sure. for real. No, I hear you. I jump up out of bed, shoot for the back door. I've got my hand on the deadbolt, open the deadbolt, open the door a crack, and I look back at the bed, and she's right, but she's talking to me in a man's voice. And she says, pull them out. Pull well, them knew, out? Well, I knew what she meant, even though it made no sense. And I feel with my right hand on the top of my head, and there are three nails, old rough nails, that have been pounded into the top of my head. Oh, my God. And when I look back at the bed, my body is laying in the bed. And I'm looking at her laying next to me, and I'm going, oh, geez, Louise. Well, I knew enough, and you'd actually said it about 15 minutes ago, never make a deal with the devil. Yes. And I realized, okay, I knew enough that this is some kind of demon or some kind of devil or a soldier or something. If I pull them out, then I'm acknowledging if I run out of the house, then I'm not dealing with it. So I just said, hey, I've got to face this now, or uh, I, this is going to go on forever. And I didn't want to move. But anyway, I just looked over, and I said, well, I realized that moment, just in a moment of clarity, I just looked at this, this woman, and it was a woman talking like a man, which was scary, and I said, no. And I just remember walking back and laying back down into my body, and it never came again. And that ended it. Wow. But it was as real as anything. At the very least, you should have followed up with a tetanus shot. Well, I moved. But anyway, I got out of that house. I, if I had woke, woke, woke up dead, I would book a flight on 800 and then go find a psychic forensic engineer to call you and tell you what really happened. Well, that that would imply, of course, that you could uh, you could uh, travel in time as a dead person. Well, hey, you didn't say I couldn't. Uh, you're absolutely correct. I don't make the rules. Thank you very you much take for care the call. Of her. Right. Uh, everybody else is, uh, has a hokey story, but here he wakes up with three rusty nails driven into his head, and a young lady on his bed to give him instructions in a man's voice. Righto. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Well, hi there. This is Janice, and I'm from Oroville, California. Hi, Janice. And this story happened quite a few years ago when my family was living in Miami. Uh, one day, my mother, I have to back up to say that she was quite the psychic. And 
one day my brother was preparing to go frothing in the Everglades during uh, that night, mm-hmm. and she begged him not to go. She said, please don't go, please don't go, you can't go. And he said, what's the matter, Mom? And uh, she says, there's going to be a plane crash. Oh, my. And uh, And he was not as much of a believer in my mother's powers as I was, of course, and when his friend came to pick him up to go frogging, she also begged him, please don't go out. There's going to be a terrible plane crash. Mm. And sure enough, there was. This was the very famous uh, famous uh, flight. I believe it was Flight 410 that crashed in the Everglades many, many, many years ago. Uh, oh, my, yes, I recall that. And as you will recall then, if you're familiar with that one, I, I am. It is a haunted uh, uh, airliner. Uh, uh, actually, airliners of the same airline are haunted by that that crew. Th- that crew. That's exactly right. Exactly. I, I, well, this even goes on that that it became a book, and then it. Uh, later on, my father was hospitalized, and he had a very nice crew taking care of him there in the hospital in Miami. And my mother had mentioned to the one nurse, and he says, are you going to be on tomorrow as well? And she says, oh, no, tomorrow's a big day. She says, we have all the family coming over. We've rented a, a large TV. They're premiering uh, the movie of the Ghost of Flight. Uh, I believe it was 410. And uh, it was either 410 so or 401. I can't. 401. I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it was 401. Mm-hmm. And uh, she, and she said, uh, you know, it was uh, my dad was on that crew. And well, I, just... I, look, I can add to this. I I can tell you, I have friends in the airline industry, and they will not talk because you know it's a good way to end a career. Oh, yeah. But they tell me there's no question about it. Um, Stews and uh, crews, uh, pilots, co-pilots, have reported seeing crew members from that flight exactly on flights, uh, and this has been going on, um, uh, not told generally outside the airlines now, for years. Eventually, when some of these people retire, we'll get the stories. I know some of them, but I promised, you know, I... So I'm, uh, it, it is definitely going on. What I have heard about that, that uh, when they recovered certain parts and put them into other airlines uh, to recycle uh, different parts that were salvageable, yes. that any plane that, uh, that received parts from that, uh, that flight ended up with crew members uh, of, the, uh, of the down plane on it. Well, I don't have any comment on that, but I, I, I thank you for the story, and I can verify without giving details that crew members of that flight have indeed been showing up on um, current flights. Okay, this is from Pam in Anchorage, Alaska. Art, this is my story. It's a true one. I was a young 24-year-old stationed at Whitman Air Force Base in Nob Noster, Missouri. I hope I got that right. I was living in an old house that had been remodeled. The house about 150 years old. Now, I'd been living there for about three months when one night I woke up because of a terrible stench. It permeated the entire house. The smell, a combination of dirt, rot, and alcohol. I was, it was so bad that it woke me up out of a deep sleep. I got up, went throughout the house to try to find the source, couldn't find a thing. Next night, again, awakened, the same smell. This time, I went across the hall to my roommate's bedroom and woke her up. She woke up asking what the awful smell was, so it confirmed in my mind I wasn't dreaming. The third night, again awakened by the smell, but this time... An old man was sitting at the foot of my bed. He had distinct features, but he was transparent. He smelled of rot, dirt, and alcohol. He just sat there. I was so startled, I sat up in bed afraid to move for hours until daylight. I went to work the next day, exhausted because of the lack of sleep. I worked with a woman 
whose father owned the house that I lived in. And so I described the old man to her that I'd seen at the foot of my bed. I told her about the awful smell of dirt and alcohol. She had a strange look on her face as I described it all. She began to tell me about the couple who'd owned the house before her father. They were an elderly couple, married for 50 years. The woman got sick, and he took care of her until she died in the house that I am now living in. The old man became so lonely and distraught that he began to drink, never leaving the house. They found the old man dead. He died in what was my bedroom. This, of course, disturbed me. I had to do something about it because I was not getting any sleep. That night, I resolved to take care of the problem. Again, I was awakened by the smell. There he was at the foot of my bed again. So I looked at him. I told him I wasn't afraid of him. I told him he was dead, and this was not his home anymore. It's mine. I told him I was taking very good care of his old house and that he needed to leave me alone and go away. He just looked sad, stared at me for a moment or so, and disappeared before my eyes. He never came back again, and neither did the smell. Art, it really happened. Well, I, I got a story here for you. All right. My story happening in Canyon City, Colorado. I was going to school at a religious school. Yes. Uh, and every weekend I'd, I'd go to this nativity shop a couple miles down the road for this, uh, you know, the, just for uh, something to do for the yes. sake of diversity. One day in particular, I, I passed a farm that had a flock of sheep and a the little buggers were kind of cool. I'd never seen sheep before outside the realm of TV. So I observed a, a sheep was standing in the corner of the fenced-in area. Have you? Are, are you a city boy? Uh, yeah, I am. Must be. <laughs> uh, and I observed the sheep standing in the corner of the fenced-in area as still as a statue while the entirety of the other part of the flock was stuffing their face in a typical sheep-like manner. Sure. A couple of days later, I saw same thing, flock together, munching, strange statue-like sheep on the other side of the field, not eating. So the next week, the same thing. But this time, that rancher was there. So I asked him, you know, uh, why the statue-like sheep was so weird. Did someone clock in the head or something? Hmm. Uh, it's the darndest sheep, he said. Uh, that sheep won't eat in the daytime, only at night. I said, bizarre. He said, you can say that again. It's so uh, scared of other, it's also scared of other sheep, but product is product, and that's what counts. I said, that's that's for sure. So that one night I was coming back from the par uh, party, and I was walking uh, by, and I could see a lone sheep, that the lone sheep eating it or chewing in the moonlight. All the other sheep, needless to say, were sleeping, but I couldn't see the sheep put its head down to a pull of grass or hay. You know, what, what's going on here? It was kind of really it was weird. You mean it was eating in midair? Yeah, it was no. eating in midair. It was totally bizarre. I couldn't understand. So one one evening, I had just purchased some night vision goggles on the back black market for a tidy price, tidy in the sense that it was cheap. I thought I'd walk uh, by the sheep again that night. Take I looked look. through my goggles uh, as I was approaching the sheep to test them out, since it was absolutely dark and there was no moonlight that night to speak up. Yes. Looking through the night vision goggles, I had, I had to check my goggles, thinking they might be lemons. Because of what I was seeing, I tried again, and there it was again. The sheep was stretching out its neck, standing on its hind legs. There, to my absolute amazement, was this neon green image of an upside-down man holding his hand high, apparently hand-feeding the sheep. And around him were other people walking upside-down with an occasional neon image of what looked like dogs. Wow! Yeah, yeah, this is totally bizarre. I sat there and tried to keep my composure for several minutes until I couldn't help myself. I picked up a rock and threw it at the neon image of the upside-down uh, man feeding the sheep. The rock hit the sheep instead that, was, that he was feeding, and the upside down man stopped abruptly. He looked over my way, apparently spotting me. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he, he made some hand gestures to the others that were walking around him, and they all disappeared. When I took the goggles down to start running, I saw several baseball sized red dots coming at me. I ran as fast as my feet could carry me, somehow lost them hiding in the combine. I stayed there for about three hours. Uh, with an occasional red dot passing by, <laughs> after uh, about three hours, I, I got out of the combine and ran like you would not believe back ah. to my dorm in ah. complete terror. Of course. Moral of this story, never throw stones at ghosts. And it's truth, too, Art.
<laughs> I, I, I appreciate the story, sir. Thank you. What what a remarkable story. And so the sheep, only eating at night, fed by spirits, up on its hind legs, reaching as its... Oh, man, what a story. <laughs> that was great. Dog Card Line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes, hi. Yes, hi. This is Helen from Chicago. Hi, Helen. Yeah. Well, uh, my husband died quite a few years ago, mm -hmm. and then about two years after he was gone, I was uh, watching TV one night, and uh, I was laying on the couch in my front room, and my dog was by my feet, and uh, he seemed to be asleep, and uh, my husband uh, knew this dog while, when he was living, and... Uh, Suddenly, my my dog sat up. He slowly got off the couch, and uh, he sat down in front of this chair next to the couch where my husband always sat. Mm -hmm. And he started to wag his tail. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he stood up, and he put his paws on the chair, and his tail was still wagging. And his head went down a little bit, and his ears went back. And uh, he looked like he was being petted. Oh, boy. Yes. Oh, boy. And I slowly sat up. This went on for, I'm watching my dog for about five minutes. And I slowly sat up. And uh, I softly said to my husband, I, I assumed it was him. I said, Johnny, if that's you, I'm very happy that you're here. And I love you. Oh. Then my... Uh, after another minute, then my dog uh, got off from the chair, and he lay down by the chair, and he, he was looking in the kitchen with his ears perked up, and his head was going from side to side like my husband was in the kitchen, and he's watching him walk around. And uh, it, I was really happy. It, that's kind of spooky, but I wasn't afraid. I was happy. I was sure that was my husband was here. Well, he probably was. Yes. I believe these things occur. Yes. I I really appreciate your call. Thank you so much. Okay, thank uh, you. Take much. care. I there, there you go. I believe that um and and I of course mentioned cats earlier. But I believe that our animals see things we don't. I rather suspect we see things they don't. But I think they have a unique ability to sense or feel or see. I'm not sure which because I don't really know. But they feel things and know things and perhaps see things that we don't and can't. And so that lady's story makes a whole lot of sense to me. All right. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. Where are you, sir? I'm in Montreal, Canada. Montreal. All right. Welcome. I listen to you every night as I'm driving around. Excellent. Tonight I got home a little early and I thought I'd call. It, it's not a spooky story per se, but it shows me that there is life on the other side. Okay. I was at a, a Native American church ceremony, which is a grandfather ceremony. It starts at dusk and goes until dawn the following morning. Right. And when I come out there that the morning after it was over, I walked down by the lake and I just wanted to go down and meditate. And as I was down by the lake, it was like a, a whirlwind came, not strong or whatever, it just like came around me. And as I looked, I seen this uh, young girl coming out of the mist. And as I got closer, I recognized her as my sister. But as she became, as she got closer and closer, she started growing up and becoming a beautiful young lady. Wow. And then as she came towards me, she just kept on going and smiled. But as she got on the other side of the the lake, she turned around and said, thank you, I love you, and I'll see you soon. So I got I got scared out of my wits with that. I ran back to the TP and I told the elder, I said, listen, I don't want to die. Huh. And he said, what do you mean? So I relayed the story to him, and he said, no, you're not going to die. She has come back to thank you for letting her go to continue her journey on the other side. And for her to say that she will see you soon, to her there's no time. All she is saying, she'll be there to meet you when you come over onto that side. Oh, that's quite a story. And, you know, and this 
this happened. My sister died in 1961, and this happened two years ago, so it, it uh, took me 34 years to let her go because we went through the residential school. And in our culture, the oldest one is to take care of the youngest one. Yes. And But as kids, we don't understand that too well, and I took that to that I let my sister down because when we were in the residential school, we made a break for her to escape, and I stole the truck, and as we went down the road, maybe a quarter of a mile, we had a head-on collision, and she died in that accident. Oh, my. And I carried that that uh, guilt and shame and whatever for the next 34 years. And he said, uh, and the way the elder explained it to me is that I didn't let her go until that ceremony. And when I did let her go, she finally started to grow up and continue on her journey the way she was supposed to go. Boy, do I appreciate that story. Thank you. You're welcome, Art. You take care. From Montreal, Canada. Do you believe? Do you believe him? Do you believe the others you're hearing? Can you really doubt there's something after all of this? Wouldn't it be kind of a cruel joke if there were not? Do we know the nature of it? No. Does it seem sure? Yes. Well, um, this whole story happened in 1981. Four of my friends and I were coming home from California uh, from a graduation trip, a high school graduation trip, coming home to Salt Lake. We were leaving Palm Springs in the, e- in the night because it was so hot, about 120 during the day, so we decided to travel at night. We were on the road outside of Palm Springs. I can't remember exactly where we were going. It was a, it was just a, a two-way road. And the sign, there was a sign that said no services for a certain amount of miles, so we knew we were going into quite a desolate part of the desert. Um, and we, here we were, you know, five young girls, never really experienced anything like we were going to experience and never have. But uh, about an hour into the desert, um, we were getting tired. A few of us were asleep. The driver, my friend that was driving, said, what is that up ahead? There's someone off to the side of the road, and we we one at a time woke up. And the minute we started looking at it, we all got the most horrible feeling. It was just an awful feeling, mm. and we couldn't figure out what was going on. As we got closer, she slowed down, and we noticed there was a woman off about maybe 10 feet off of the road. She was she had white hair, long white hair, white skin, this long flowing white robe a dress holding a white dog on a chain in the middle of nowhere art we had not even seen any cars for a long long time there were no you know homes or we had not gone through any towns and as we got closer we realized what it was and the wind hadn't even been blowing that night but her dress was blowing her hair was blowing and she looked at us with the most evil eyes. I have never seen. She didn't look human. Um, her skin was so pale and white. Mm-hmm. And she looked at us to the left, and as we went by her slowly, her head turned so far. There's no way any human head could turn that far to follow us. And it was it was freaky. The most shades, freaky thing I've shades, ever seen. Yep, shades of the exorcist. Oh, it was just unreal. We were We were so upset for for a long time after that and every time we get together now after all these years we always talk about that white lady in, in a white dress with her dog in the middle of nowhere there you are there you are uh, there you are thank you very much for the call and the story 